I hope you're all drinking wine because I think without drinking wine yourself, I'm really thinking that that when you watch this, you should really be drinking wine. Otherwise, it's gonna sound like an hour of bullshit. It's probably already. <laughs> No, you do it with breakfast, like I do with my podcast. I'm always doing breakfast and I listen to them. That's true. But then we should have more content about, like, really um, about a subject. Should we, should we introduce what are we actually doing here? Let's just make a small intro. Yeah, I, mean, I think it all started two, actually two weeks ago or one week ago, one and a half. Jesus Christ, there was so much al alcohol already going down the drain. In two weeks, yeah. In two weeks. Um, when we actually together came up with the idea of now you called me to come for a glass of wine, which escalated <laughs> tremendously. I think you should start with... <laughs> now the whole thing is that we actually, when both when we worked in Horeca or when I worked in Horeca or in hospitality, that I actually almost in, always enjoyed the conversations after you're actually done with work. And then you sit together with your colleagues and you just open a shitload of wines and you just so drink wine, yeah. and you get more and more and more expensive the later the night goes and it's going completely More bananas. You are exactly the better the bottles. And now in this whole Corona shit and this whole quarantine shit, a lot of hospitality guys are sitting at home, and I don't have those wine conversations anymore. No. So then we met up, had a glass of wine, we drank a couple of bottles, yeah. and then we said, actually, we should fucking record this and use this platform to, yeah, I don't know, just open up uh, discussions and conversations. This is not going to be a tasting club. This is not going to be a review club. I think we're gonna just open wine, drink it, get a little bit drunk. You know, and that is mostly. episode one of Bar Arnold. Yeah, it's Bazanji. Now we're not. Check it, check it. Uh, I said this industry is dark. I started drinking so my and Figo started importing it. I think maybe we drank it once, but I didn't know so much about it. The first thing I drank was this on, I think it was Lynn's birthday. When they had the, um, the the party in the cellar in Partizan, you remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Olivier was not a sommelier there. He just started working there and he brought this. The friend of Lynn. Yeah. I don't remember if he got Magnums. It may, it may have been Magnums. I was like, it's so fucking energetic. It's super good. Mm. It's not too fruity. I don't know how it holds up with mouse, but. Mm. No, but Blaue Wildbacher. 11% of alcohol. It's good. It's fucking good. This no. will go down easy. <laughs> We're not gonna fill the show with this fucking bottle. Then I but know. Blau Wildbacher is is similar like like Welsh Riesling, but not even worse. It's the same like Alicote in Burgundy. You know when it was only made for a shitload of amounts of grapes, and then um, some young wine guys or some some biological wineries just found those grapes and they were like, wait a second, this can be really fucking cool. Yeah. And then he made something big out of it. And Blau Wildbacher think. I only know it from Strohmeyer and one of those Frizzante guys. Or the fuckers. Or, the, or still the farm fucking table wine. Yeah, it still, still was. You can still buy it in the supermarket? Of course, days? two liters, yeah. but it's not, it's not labeled as Blau Wildbach, it's labeled as wine from, yeah, wine from yeah, Europe. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> wine from Europe, two liters. <laughs> <laughs> and Strohmeyer was one of, the, one of the first guys I tasted, which said, Without like, hey, this is really cool shit. And he started it, and he made it as a frizzante, 11% alcohol, super juicy, easy going, boom, boom, boom. Have you ever been to him? No, I met him, and I think his wife. Because where is he in uh, Austria? I was, I, I, honestly, my Austrian wine knowledge is uh, not where it should be. Mm. So I always forget, you know, you know, Kamtal and all that stuff. Yeah. But Styria. this is from Styria? Yeah. Uh, this is where uh, Preitzinger is as well, no? No, and, uh, well, now, um, next border. Oh. Yeah. So it's uh, okay. Let's first. You have Breising is Burgenland and Judith Beck is Burgenland and all the Panobile guys, and then you have the next region, which is Styria. We have a lot of Welsh Riesling and a lot of acidity wines. And very east. Super south. 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 Um, south. 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 Um, Italian border almost. Oh really? I think so. Yeah. I don't okay. know. I'm not that good at, at, at maps. <laughs> at, and my, shit. at my country. Uh, that's the same for me. The the countries that were easier to. Um, remember, is the countries where you go. So, you know, Italy, France, mm. uh, but also I have major issues with Germany, especially of course with the predicat uh, misery. I never, I never seem to remember. Mm. But um, yeah, for this wine, it, I really, it really takes my my uh, attention. I do was surprised. I had the white one, mm -hmm. the the Sonne, 
which the is what? Sona, it's called, I think. Cool. And uh, I don't even know what the fuck was in it. I didn't even check. Shall I check for the, for the, for the check? But I was uh, drinking it on Sunday and I didn't finish the bottle. What? And then, yeah, because I also had a pretty serious bottle of red I needed to taste for my work. No excuse. Gramenol. Okay, think excuse. If you have one glass of that, it was it was heavy shit. And then uh, I thought, oh, I'll keep it to the next day. Dude, this is good. And I already texted, um, I already texted Figo, like, hey, man, I still have half a bottle left. He said, oh, no. He said, <laughs> you could be fucked. You could be in trouble. <laughs> this is good, man. This is really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. This is fucking cool. I think I had this leader wise already in my Austria time. Dude. This is good, man. And this is what I really like about, I don't know, Styria, that you just always have high acidity, minerality, and at the same time, yeah, kind of a strange the, fruit. But the, w the weird thing is, of course, that there are some... Austria is not really, uh, per se, a very mystical country, in my opinion. It's, a, it's Where? A, in, in Holland, you mean? No, just in my, in my view. I don't view Austria as a very mystical place, natural, nature-wise, uh, people-wise, wine-wise, food-wise. It's not something that really catches my attention as, say, uh, Georgia, mm. where you know it's a, it's a really powerful land with fucking crazy history and people. Yeah. Uh, but for some reason, there is a group of winemakers in Austria that really do, does catch my attention in that, uh, attention in that way. Mm. So. The wines I like from Austria are really particular and they are really, really strong and energetic wines. And also the people I meet that make them, they're very no noble and let's say uh, modest people. They're not easy to talk to maybe sometimes. True. Like Seth Muster, who is probably the... Really? I, I, don't, I don't think I ever met him. Yes, we did. We did together. He was the Jesus tall guy Christ. on the corner with the brown jacket that said nothing. <laughs> With the lady that kept that saying what a hard time she was having. And you had, a, you had a good conversation with him or a bad one? No, I came up to Because the he was the top. I asked the lady, no, she said nothing. You know, like, and I was like, okay, man, thank you. But Wait, that was at Latif two years yeah. ago when we went there and he went in the back and she came in the front and she actually took care of us. Yeah, but like this time I came, it was the same thing. He was just talking with some people and then she was standing in the front and I asked her, hey, how are you doing? It's like really hard. It's really hard. It was like, you need a hug, man. It's like she was really, uh, she was really struck. And she but was it says so happy. About they're really, they're really modest people. They, she was absolutely not used to being blown away like this, talking so much. Uh, and she really was so happy when I started talk German to her. She was yeah, so relieved. Probably. She was yeah. like, oh my God, thankfully and I don't have, have to uh, talk uh, English. And then you have Strohmeyer, who has a constant smile on his face. Mm -hmm. He's a very, uh, he's a fun guy. And for me, these wines are something that really, uh, that really, I've been thinking a lot about it now. Like we talked uh, last time about, you know, uh, maybe starting into a wine import with a guy who's been doing it since forever. And he was struck after drinking Bordeaux for 20 years with the, the, the purity, the energy of, say, wines from Marcel Lapierre mm -hmm. and um, Metras and these kind of guys. And then he, so his imports based a little bit around these flavors, these kind of winemakers. And for, uh, I think he got caught with the energy of it. So it's not- The wine friend. Yeah. So it's not okay. Really, it was like drinking Bordeaux every day and then he drank a bottle of Beaujolais from La Pierre and mm. it's just energy, fruit, mm. wine, fun. But is this, this is the same thing when we came in touch with natural yeah, wine or biological yeah. wine for the first time. It's exactly. Like, what but the fuck me, is this? But now when I think about what for me does that trick, it's these kind of wines. Mm. I, I was uh, at Figo today, I tasted something, I thought, man, I probably Hank wouldn't like it, and a lot of people wouldn't like it, but the energy that bottle spit out, even though there was faults in it, and it had some mouths, it, it grips. And for me, this is so pure, so clear, so energetic, it just wants to get in my body <laughs> badly. Boom! <laughs> And I am now thinking about how, you know, is, is this not now my new essence of um, what I like to taste? Do I still really give a shit about if there's bread or volatile acidity, oxidation? No, I actually really don't think so. I think I taste the wine and I say, oh, it's, it's very lively. Or it's probably the first thing now I say about wine. I say it's lively, it's, it's got energy, and then I'll go fruit, 
compared to other things or whatever or flavor profiles. Mm. And for me, if you drink this, actually now I'm saying flavor profiles is the first thing, uh, first time I think about flavor, nose, structure. The only thing I've been thinking for the first two glasses is how fun is it, mm. and how completely easy mm. is it going down. But what if? But th this is the story I always hear about natural wine. Yeah, it's so vibrant, has a lot of energy, it's, it's yeah, so cool. I know you cool. think it's a bit more bullshit, huh? No, 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 I, d I don't think so. I'm just more... Grapefruit, by I the way. I don't know. I think so too. What I'm always doing is I always take like, I don't know, four steps back and I was like, what if I drink super old, super awesome Burgundy right now? What if I drink a single vineyard, Puigny, Morrochet, Domaine, Ramonet, yeah, 1990, Burgundy. whatever? Yeah, it's gonna be probably... It's gonna be fucking amazing. And that mm. shit is probably full with sulfide. It is because I drank it. Yeah, and it's fucking and, and, and amazing. And in the 90s, they had a little bit of a sweet tooth for a wood. And in 1980-something, we had glucose in our wines and now we fucking love Austria. But the thing yes. is, also if I drink a ripe champagne, which has nothing to do with anything biological, I still think, man, this is good yeah, stuff. You're now talking about two regions in wine where the wine has always been expensive, or at mm. least say in the last 50 years, so yeah. at least since the agricultural revolution of the 60s, 70s and 80s, where they started using more and more crap and uh, industrial techniques to produce wine, mm. uh, they always already had more money, so they wouldn't pick with a fucking tractor, they wouldn't spray everything with sulfide because they already were making clean and fine wine, they don't need to use so much shit. Yeah. I think for me the biggest fuck up in the more um, uh, rich uh, wine producing regions at least in France and also in Italy uh, like Barolo and uh, Piemont and Tuscany is the use of wood and adding flavor profiles of wood and uh, yeah, of course also in the winemaking there's been too mm. much fucking around. Mm. You know, chaptalization, like adding sugars and doing all these fucking weird things that I've been doing. Why is oak fucking around for you? Because I don't, I don't think that... Uh, or too much use of oak and make it super barrique and... Okay, but aging in oak is not a problem. But you're yeah. usually using super... Uh, using a lot of new and toasted wood completely removes the essence of the wine for me. Mm. It's like, uh, yeah. It's like adding vanilla or adding another flavor. It's, it, as long as the, the wood is used to yeah. breathe the wine, to age the wine, and yeah. to do something with it in its natural way, I find it quite interesting. That's why I like wines from Bottis from, or other big kind of barrels like they used in Burgundy. But they never used Barrique in Burgundy until I don't know when, but probably uh, no idea. they always used the, 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 bigger, the bigger barrels, yeah. used them for 20, 30 years. The real problem I have with oak is that the people, there was a, a certain period of time, and still there is with a couple of people, is that they assert Barrique and oakiness to quality, and that's just wrong. Yeah. If a lot of people which are going to wine tastings... Who are you talking about? <laughs> To who are you talking to about wine? To right? thousands of guests. Yeah, you too. Nah, but the thing yeah. is, you, you know that when you when you have a wine which has no oak and a wine which has uh, oak, and you have someone who is like, hey, we're completely open to this, I just like this and this and this, and you pour them, it's like you go to a winemaker and you have a tasting, they always give you the young wine first, and then this is my Sauvignon, and this is my Chardonnay, and this is my whatever the fuck, and these are my single vineyards, and these are the really special things. And then they say like, and the special things, between the lines are made for when you drink them in 10, 15 years. And of course now they have a shitload of oak, but you should not drink them now. You should drink them in 20 years. But I'm gonna give you a taste now, and then it tastes this shit, and it's complete full of vanilla and chocolate and barrique. And then they assert, oh, this is the best stuff. This is 100 euros or 60 euros or 200 euros. So sweetness and vanilla and is barrique is quality. But, but, it is but it's not the fault of the winemaker, like but the people now think that oak yeah. is quality, and but that's just oak, bullshit. Oak is, some, is like, you have barrel aging, which is just a very classic technique. And if you use used barrels, there's nothing wrong with it. But when people start in English talk about oak, and in Dutch when they say hout gedijpt, they just mean this fucking horrible flavor that they add to these wines, and all these people that we're talking about. Of all these guests in that high-end restaurant you worked, 
maybe one tenth of uh, those people that said something like this really know what it means. Mm. Most of the people, they drink shit wine always, especially till 10 years ago, man. Yeah, how many people would spend 25 euros on a bottle of wine? Yeah. And uh, I think oak has also gone out of fashion, just like sweetness in Riesling has gone out of fashion. And I completely all agree. The I agree. I agree. For me, the pureness of this, I don't even know if this is barrel aged. It could be. I don't think so. But Do you know what the thing is? I think that because of natural wine or because of those Maybe wineries... Maybe I'm saying something stupid, but... Probably. Not if it's... Uh, or if it's but it, uh, that's the cool thing that no one is watching this. Those wineries made it happen that we put all those things away with like, guys, you don't need oak. And now we look at the labels and we're like, I don't care if it's an oak or not. It doesn't say anything. Also, the alcohol degree doesn't say anything anymore. Yeah. I drink this and we downed the bottle now in I don't know what. Yeah. And this is what it is about. And in my first job I had, I have ever had in my life, my boss told me, you always see a good product, like in coffee, when someone drinks an espresso and he's ordering his second one. Then yeah. you know you have a good product. But they don't care if it's Lavazza or something. But if you something. have a fucking good steak, a really nice fucking I steak. I cannot eat a second one. No, but do you want somebody to put a fucking cheap ass gravy that they make from powder and pour it all over it? Or do you just want to eat it with pepper and salt? Well, for me, it's a very, it's a very logical answer, but good explanation. A lot of people would like that fucking shitty sauce, you know. Same goes uh, for so many things in food. And mm. the weird thing is, I use that comparison a lot. You know, I told you a lot of times, like when I, people ask me, "Okay, uh, why do you drink natural wine?" I don't know if I like it. Yeah, man. But when the first time your mother gave you blue cheese. Did you say, oh, I really prefer this over that cute fucking shit from the factory? <laughs> or did you say, what the fuck did you give to me? Yeah. But now you're a grown-up and you ate so much cheese in your life that you maybe think like, uh, hey, uh, probably I really want a piece of blue cheese after my dinner and not five cubes of that shit <laughs> with some mustard. Mm. Or for starter. Yeah, same goes for, for, for bread. If you go, if you want bread, do you buy a super nice su uh, sourdough that maybe costs you eight euros? And after the first day, you can only toast it because it comes hard as a log, but it's fucking tasty. Or do you want to buy the one meter loaf from the supermarket that's 80 cent and after 10 days, it's still flimsy like a piece of paper? I agree. But, so those, that's a, that's a, that but those two groups of people always existed. There were always the people who were like buying yeah. big spare ribs from the Albert Heijn below whatever. Yes. And they say like, I just want to have a mass and it has to be juicy. And then there are the people who are like, you know what? I don't have to eat that much meat. No. But when I buy that, when I buy meat, I want to have a good thing. But those two things, they always existed. And now since, to come back to the wine thing, and now since those type of wines are coming, we are putting immediately on a stamp on it. It's like natural wine. And now you also have two groups, which are not necessary. And I was always on the side of both. I was like, I enjoy Le Flef from the 90s. And I also enjoy... A nine euro, I don't know what the fuck, if it's as long as it's singing. Yeah, but you know what the I mean? thing is, you're talking about all kinds of. Oh, fuck. Well, there went the embryo. There goes your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it looks like the shit I just pulled off my kombucha yesterday. No, but the thing is, I'm talking about middle class people, people that go out for dinner, people that, spend, people that don't drink fucking beer, people that go to the supermarket and actually think. When they take the four and a half euro wild pig bottle, it's better than the two and a half euro Kaapse Praal. But you always wine. will have them. Yes, but I can tell that in the supermarket, middle class, average people are buying the cucumber with the organic label. They pay one euro extra for everything. Mm. They will buy the sourdough. They will, like now there's a fucking bread hype going on in Amsterdam that is unparalleled. Mm. COVID has put sourdough bread, everybody's baking sour bread, everybody wants to go to the sour bread bakery, uh, sourdough. That's what they put on the toilet paper. Ah, yeah, exactly. Bam. Class. See? But the thing is, with wine, you really have to still tell people how that, you still have to convince them. But I can already tell, like in my friend circle, you know. Well, what sorry, what, what do you mean with convince them? that it's nicer than that that the sourdough is better than the one meter loaf in wine comparison but isn't it not because that's also a thing is when i go to a winery which makes shit wine they always tell me like 
uh, tradition meets modern. I took it over from my father. I make mm. such an awesome wine. You smell berries, uh, strawberry and whatever. A really good winemaker. He always is like, taste it. So oh. Just try it. And this is the thing. And, and I think, but let the product speak for itself. Yes, but people go to the supermarket. No, 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 this is not a discussion right or wrong. It's just... Yes. <laughs> no, but you know what no. I mean? No. When I drink this, there can also be on the label soda water. And I'm like, this is one fucking incredible soda water. Yes, but uh, we're talking about wines. I can tell, though, that people are getting... Uh, people are starting to change, change your mind. And I really thank COVID and I thank some shops in Amsterdam for... Uh, also with Figo, you know, I think not a lot of people would have gone to shoe for dinner because it's 200 euros and it's a guy high-end restaurant. It's not very easy to walk into. But now he opened a wine shop and he put it on Instagram. People thought, oh, I can just go there for a bottle of wine that's maybe 10 euros and maybe I buy more. Perfect, perfect. He's got like 20-year-old girls coming in and they buy it all no. like. That, that's super good and I really feel that field is opening up a shop like Levin and Levin where people can come in for a coffee and a, and a, and a, and a sourdough I don't know what galette and then they ask for a bottle of wine and they can start with something that's 15 euros and when they get acquired to the taste they can buy a 60 euro one you know before that was only going to Fleck like which always. maybe isn't the most um, easy wine shop to walk into if you don't know a lot about it and i really really appreciate that that's changing but it's taken a fucking long time but um more and more people are getting uh, interested and are super open to it the thing is also what i what i love about this new wine business kind of thing is like decades ago you walked into a into a wine shop and the wine shop was like a dude with a with a oh. yeah with I'm gonna, a, eat the, I'm gonna eat the egg here <laughs> with a tie and he was like yeah you have to drink this and you have to drink this fucking good. and then you're like you have to listen to the guy and you know you have to you you have to get rid of 100 euros here now and you're completely fucked over yeah, exactly. and now and then i only know the austrian story van and co came along and van and co made this kind of a little bit open and and you can also taste it here and blah blah blah, blah. grape district grape district and and uh, Halechal and whatever the fuck yeah. um but especially those type of wines, and I'm not stamping them as natural wines, but those type of wines, they really made it completely open, that the people not even watching what kind of grape is in it. Blauer Wildbacher. No, okay. they don't care, but people see the fucking label and they hear... But it's, it's not even about labels anymore. Look yes, at this shit. This is, is, is like... And the funny thing is, there is something about names. I think even before I knew about Strohmeyer, when you see the bottle, when you hear it, for some fucking reason it rings. So it's kind of maybe do you have a, do you think you build up an instinct for what's good wine or not because uh, no not even Strohmeyer but if you put like if you put somebody that's got no fucking clue and you put maybe five bottles of wine in a row and one of them is Strohmeyer and the rest of the, of the four are maybe like biodynamic but let's say not as uh, interesting wines as that I think still nine out of ten people if they really don't know nothing about wine. Maybe if they read the labels, they'll get confused. I think a lot of people will still pick this. I don't know why. Why? After they taste it. I think the originality speaks in everything. You know, also this has the, the funny, uh, the funny, um, yeah, yeah, the long thingy. With what you put on chicken uh, legs when you cook them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the long white thingy. <laughs> There's uh, no. I fucking have an empty <laughs> glass. There's something going horribly yeah. wrong. I'll feed your shall cactus. We, just shall we, shall we? Yeah, I actually set up the table today and I was like, I need some nice plants. And I was like, what would be perfect for the podcast to do a cactus? Yes. Should and we analyze the, the wine first? The person that has the shittiest wine has to lick it. The, 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 the Strohmeyer? Yeah, what do you think? Shall I start? Yes, you start. I fucking love it. I really do. But? Nix, nothing but. No. Um, the, the, the thing for me is it has super high acidity. It's, I don't know about the minerality, but it's, it's almost on the peak of getting sour. And at the same time, I get this super cheap fruit, which is definitely the Blauer Wildbacher, which is super purple and it's super, uh, I don't know, it's super like unripe kind of thing in the, in the fruit and I completely get smashed in the face. And then I drink it and it's actually super long, it's super refreshing. And this is something which I can drink with serious food, like a really good salad. 
<laughs> which I never eat, <laughs> or on the same time, like a, having a good time with a shitload of people, you do a barbecue, you sit outside, and you just <laughs> pop the bottle and you just drink it. And this is exactly what I love about wine. Not high sophisticated, you don't have to explain a lot, but it's just super simple. Yes. Super simple, super good. Super simple, but super uh, intelligent expensive. wine. No, it's not so yeah. expensive. I think it's super intelligent. I think making something that is that refined, but that easy, that's the, that's the, that's the trick. For me, it's wine, uh, well, my whole brain is screaming grapefruit. You say fruit, cheap fruit, acidity, that for me is... Like when you eat a grapefruit, it's not per se the flavor and the taste, but it's like the, when you eat it, you, you, you kind of get annoyed with the acidity, but you want to keep eating it and you know it's good. And it's got that deepness to it, that orange miss. It's got that sweetness that a lemon misses. It's got a, that meaty aspect that a lime misses. For me, in some fucking freaky corner of my mind, this reminds me, it reminds me of eating a, a grapefruit in the morning. Nice. You really don't know. Love it's, it. it's kind of sophisticated as well. You don't really, as a as a sixteen year old, you don't decide I eat a grapefruit in the morning. But now, one of my favorite breakfasts is just spooning out a, a grapefruit. And I think that acidity, that 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 easiness, but that kind of friction between being easy and super complicated, that is what does this wine for. When me. did you learn to explain wine like this? Oh, did you, what did you I do learned the from last two years? <laughs> Where can I get this? Is this the Weinfriend wine? No, no, you go to Figo. Okay, Figo at Schuh, Amsterdam Central Station. Zuiver, Zuiver Weine. Zuiver Weine. And you I can get this. go to Schuh, they're gonna open up a web shop. And you go there and you see, I you come from Bar Arnold text, and you get a text, 20% text, discount. Text Figo, text Figo. He's got a lot of more of this. And uh, I think for me, he is actually, you know, when he started importing is about when we were doing Partizan and I did quite a, try to buy as much wine from him as I could because I really, really admire his, his super persistent uh, flavor and his, uh, yeah, he, 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 you can tell him whatever you want. He won't let you really bring him off his path, but he always asks everybody for his opinion. I think his. His tasting is probably one of the most interesting I've seen. I wouldn't say he's a classically super good taster, but when he tastes, man, the guy never misses the ball. And everything he has started to import since he mm. started to get involved into Zuiverweine, mm. ah, there have been some maybe things that he also knows, you know, you, because in the price point, you have to make some concessions. Mm. But for me, all the high end, he's been getting in and he's been get, reeling in some really good winemakers right now. Okay, if we, uh, he's settling in for me as one of the best wine importers in Europe. Okay, we already do a, a circle jerk about Figo. Do you know what I like hey about man. Figo? Hey, yeah. The, the Figo is for me a completely bred entrepreneur. He's like, I'm gonna open this pop up restaurant, I'm gonna make a wine import, I'm gonna do this and do that. And um, that's what I really like about Figo. Yeah. I don't really like his complete portfolio. I love his wine card shoe, but you know I'm just not a really big okay, Rifo fan. No. And you guys are absolutely crazy about Rifo, and I just don't like it that much. But, but I think it's a good winemaker, but I just don't like the wines, which is a completely... But you know, if you're a wine I also want to speak, you speak the whole no. time. No, but th th this, is what I, this is what I really love about Figo, and Figo is always like really direct and really bam, straight. When we were at Latif with him and we were a little bit drunk, he was still like bullseye. Yeah, that's what I love. Okay, shall I explain this? What we drink right now? Yeah, we're drinking something for your body, soul, and mind. For load out of, what? We're drinking something for your mind, uh, body, soul, and mind. Yeah, this is what I thought about after the first Strohmeyer that we drink now is spa wine, which is for our soul and mind. No, <laughs> boom. Let's body. drink the next one. Uh, went to Walter Peaksman. Yeah. And I went to him and was like, I'm gonna do a podcast with Arian, and he was like, the fuck, eh? Um, and I was like, whatever you have, I take this wine. And it was a really good Sauvignon Jura, which we had last Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> if you can remember, it was no, it was actually not that good. It was pretty heavy. It's pretty fluffy, um, yeah. Yeah, it was good, but it was really fluffy. It was yeah. like you can put it on a knife and put it on a on a bread. And, yeah. like, um, and then I, I just told him like, I actually there is no flight or any idea what we're gonna drink. Just give me something which you drank in the last months and which you like. And he gave me Plota Rosenberg because he's really a fan of Plota Rosenberg. Plota Rosenberg is an Austrian winery. 
uh, super biological Demeter. They're going completely bananas, completely crazy, low in alcohol wines. Um, I actually don't really have a big story about them. I just remember when I worked at Vanskandar at Moritz um, that we tried some stuff from Plota Rosenberg. And uh, in my Austrian time, it always popped up. There was always Plota Rosenberg. And sometimes, um, no, not sometimes, all the time when I drank Plota Rosenberg, it was always a wine which was too complicated for me. There were always too many layers in between. I was always like, okay, this is a cool uh, cool label. Okay, they're really demeter. They really go all the way. They really go the extra mile. Whenever I drank it, it was like, there's so many different layers in it that I could just not drink that really easily. Was it that much? No, there were, there were too many, I don't know, tannins. Sometimes and, and maybe with like, uh, yeah, like with Jeff Mister sometimes as well. Or? Moose is also I find a lot of Stephen Hawking of wine, man. This is yeah. so fucking crazy. Also and with thickness and stuff, like uh, that's what I mean. The yeah, and always really on the orange side. Yeah. And we are not on the orange side. We're really on the... What was that Grüner Feldliner we did in Partizan again? The, um, uh, Bel Naturel, Jujic. Yeah. Yeah, really? but that's not, that's not orange. No, but yeah. it also had that, that crazy oily thickness yeah. that I... Yeah. It confuses me a little. But this is the stuff when we talk about Jujic or when we talk about the wine what we love to, to drink, it's always like this Loire, Jura, Alicote kind of thingy, you know, like super high acidity, minerality, Man, freshness, bam, bam, bam. Glass, huh? I, I didn't even taste yeah. it, I don't know. But always when I drank Plotter Rosenberg, so when I drank Plotter Rosenberg, um, it was always a little bit too much skin macerated or too many layers or too intelligent for me. So I was just dumb fuck drinking this. And it was always like, not a little, a lot of fun in it. But the Walter gave this to me. I is think. it a macerated? No idea. I don't know the wine. Is it Grüner? No. Um, it's Vivas. That's what the wine is called. I don't know. Um, let's just drink. <laughs> we really, really read. It has sulfites. We really read a lot. That it contains ah! sulfites. <laughs> 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 oh, fucker. Oh, this is good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there cut. you go. No, no cut. This is what, this is what happens to everyone. No, yeah, this is good. But actually, it's really drinkable, but it's, it's a it bit... It smells shit like tramina yeah, and muscat tacky. and super aromatic. Yeah, super aromatic. But it's also... It smells like this... Like this banana and... Ma- you, but you know, yeah. the no It yet? smells like the... You, you know there is... You sit at the bar and you know there is a girl around with a lot of makeup and a lot of ah. perfume, but you don't know it yet and you look to the right but and to the left sharp, and then you see her. But it's not that sharp, you know? So it, for me, it reminds really of like, you know, the noinches? The orange one. The mm. noinches, the little yogurt thingies in the different colors. You didn't have them? Fru-fru. Yeah, you, you can put you can put a, a, yeah, stick a thing in it and put it in ice. <laughs> it's, the, it's the orange one. What is it called in Holland? Danontje. Danontje. Because Danon is the, is the grand. Uh, French. No, we uh, call it Fru. It's the no. French. It's the French name. We call we call it Fru-Fru. And we got Danontje. So, but it smells like the orange Fru-Fru. Can you grab the crackers and water behind you? Yes. Why? Because I need some water. What, dude? I need a cigarette. I love it. I love it how you take it. Restaurant owner. <laughs> so we're fucking eating crackers right now. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. Mm. We're actually having fun. I hope everybody else is. It's probably already. <laughs> but then again, this wine. The only so the good. only reason why we do this is there are a lot of hospitality guys and they don't have those wine conversations. Yeah, and I they agree. still don't. But they can listen to ours. But so, but <laughs> if you want to listen for an hour to something, it. Should contain a line, but it is not an hour. It's just twenty minutes. The uh, the battery is already empty. Really? Mm-hmm. No. No, it's not. I don't know. No, no. But I'm just saying. It's good. No, you can see it in the mirror. See, this oh, is perfect. Yeah. But I'm just saying uh, that, it, that, it's, that it's good to, to sit there and think about it. So this wine, just to cut out that last bit with the crackers. Eleven uh, percent dry. What the fuck should it be? You think we're gonna look it up? Tramina, Muscat. It's got no a, idea. It's got some Muscat going on, huh? It's just super. Uh, I th- this is super romantic. I would also, I was, I would also drink this in the summer with the sun and. Uh, yeah, but not in the sun, maybe. Let's see. Um, Why? Yeah, maybe for the alcohol it is, but the viscosity when it's this thick, I, I don't really enjoy is, it. Um, do you know what my problem with this wine is? It's 11% alcohol. If the label would say 13 and a half, I would say like, I agree. It's really, yeah, like you drink it and yeah. there's like, it's really going big. 
and yeah. it's really not a lot of fun after the Strohmeyer. And I don't want to compare it to the Strohmeyer, but when I when I drink this, I'm like, hmm. I cannot really down this really fast. I'm not no, really enjoying it as it, much as I can. It kind of but this is what I'm talking when I'm telling you about what my new kind of really realization. It's not a new realization, but uh, let's see. Uh, it never really says what it is. Uh, in this wine guide, wine plus uh, in punkt eu. Hmm? Fuck off. Well, let's uh, keep that for another time. I hope I could find it easy. We can just put a line here in the in the podcast. What oh it, what yeah, it that's really what is. we should do. That's a good idea. But you know what I think? What it is? Something for your body, soul, and mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's good. I think it's it's but okay. But we're not gonna finish the bottle. No, we're not gonna finish it. And this is where you go. Exactly. And now we're fucked. That's the point. Yeah. And I really, I really want to have an honest conversation. I don't want to bash the wines. No. But I have to say, this is the problem I always had with Plotter Rosenberg. But always. This is, this, is, this is what I'm telling you. I had a very... I had a Sauvignon Blanc from Strohmeyer. Also thick, also high in fruit. But that bottle would have been gone. And for me, this is what I'm saying. Like This could be the, a magnum. The, the less... Uh, the more we're drinking these kind of wines, the harder it is to drink other wines. And uh, I think really for me that acidity bangs it in. And that's, hey, there's some acidity in here, but honestly, compared to that, it's not going to be in there so much. And I'm super curious about what you think about the next one, because uh, it's it's a Rifo. Do you make this? Yeah, I do. Ah, I, have a, I have a freezer here. Bam, get down. <laughs> But it's not just. Uh, everybody seems to think that every wine from um, that every wine that looks orange from Monsieur Sebastian Rifo. I've been to this guy. You know that? Yeah, I've been, been to there this, too. Uh, oh, you've been too. Is orange. So people always say, "Yeah, it's orange. It's orange." So I got a guy. That's a lie. That's fake news. Orion. That's fucking fake news. So the first, there is also a wine with with sulfur. Yes, Cateron. Cool. Yeah, it, come on, don't bu- don't don't uh, over uh, bullshit here. What? Yeah, I know it's cut Oh well, no, but sold the fuck out of it. But you know, so, yeah, exactly. We sold because the, the fuck people loved it more. Than we the, sold the fucking real stuff. we sold fucking magnums uh, of Carteron, which is is, is like uh, Agnani, same wine, but it's sulfited. This is Axinus, uh, but you really have to be careful because. If it doesn't say this little stamp maceration, maceration, it's not maceration. So I was there was really a, what the yeah. Fuck, man. The He's funniest so crazy, thing is, crazy guy. Yeah, but the funny thing is, our friend Simon J. Wolf, represent G, and uh, a bunch of other wine geeks, they went for an orange wine tasting, and some genius bought a bottle of um, Oxines, I think, 2014. And they had it lined up. I saw it a couple of Instagram hits as it coming up, like, oh, you had a super good orange wine tasting. So I commented, not to, not to bitch, because it's honestly, I would want to know. And I texted, um, hey guys, I don't think uh, that was an orange wine. And You cannot put water in the wine glass, dude. Oh, why is that? <laughs> because there's already wine in it. It's perfect. You know, a lot of wineries, let me... Let me give you a small glass yeah, introduction. I don't a lot of wineries don't like the Salto glasses anymore because they're just com- showing everything of the wine. That's what I heard. Really? Yeah. So if you put water in it, everything is destroyed. Oh. Everything is... You, you cannot do anything anymore. You're completely okay, fucked up. Nah. Um, so this guy, uh, yeah, he, I've been there. I think he's fucking crazy. I think he does all the things right in the middle of Sancerre. He, uh, he ages for a long, man. He's selling now. He's now dumping out even 2010 wines. He keeps shit in his cellar. He works the right way. I've been in his vineyards. The, the, the contrast with neighboring vineyards is so describe, describe the right way. The right way is when... Is in which way? Okay, for me, what, the, what Sebastian Info is doing is he's working in a very... That's what I'm trying to say. 
he's working in an area where everybody's working very much commercially. This guy is doing nothing commercially. He's keeping wine in his cellar for longer than anybody would just because he wants them to be drunk at the right time, at the right moment. Uh, he's completely uh, biodynamic in the vineyard. He, um, but he also makes some easy choice. Like when we were there, people were pruning and he's not pruning himself. He just gets like this tempo team of pruners in. And he tells them how he wants it pruned. The fuck is a pruner? A pruner and somebody cuts the, cuts the, the vines in uh, February to cool. prune. Well, so like we go to a vineyard and ask him, hey man, how old is this vineyard? And he says, well, that depends. I said, that depends. That was the first time I heard this answer. He said, yeah, you know, the vineyard is uh, planted by my grandfather in the 40s, but like 30 years ago, 20% uh, of it died, and the last 10 years, 20% of it just passed away of natural causes. So I just replanted some vines. I was like, mm -hmm. really? You got a vineyard that's got 70, yeah. 40, yeah. And 10 year old finds, he said, Yeah, man, I'd rather keep it like this and like an own ground. It's like, Oh, yeah, uh, half of the population died. Like, let's kill everyone <laughs> and make new babies. And let's keep the old ones in quarantine the and the young ones are going for groups in Always hear, hearing, like, Oh, this is this is planted then. I was like, Well, oh, wow. maybe I was done by then still, but okay. Uh, now you hear it more often, but I think this guy has always worked from his heart and the way he makes his wine, the oxidation, he picks everything extremely late. Yeah, so is, is I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna let you put a completely fan uh, no, fetish now over thing, before. The boat right is man, the fucking choice to let shit rot and throw away 20% of your grapes. I think it's it makes okay, let's try it. It makes what it is. I was at Rifo, tried all the all it's, the wines from him. It just smells like Rifo. And just still, and still, a shitload of people came into our shop, and were calling us, and they were like, "Hey, Rifo, do you have this?" And I was still like, "No, I don't. We don't have it. I don't like it." But I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a uh, Rifo uh, fascist or something. But, but I'm this, like this. I bet you. Let me finish. I was drinking it years ago, and I was really like. No, I don't like it. This exactly what we talk about natural wine that we see like, hey, this needs to be precise and this needs to be vibrant and energetic and fresh and it needs to be acidity and it needs to be fun to drink. You know, all the shit we talk about all the time. The shit we talked about, Strohmeyer, and where we said like, Plo Rosenberg doesn't have it. It's for me, Rifo is exactly the same. And I can drink Maceration, no Maceration, Acmenin, whatever we all call it. I still say like, completely respect Rifo for what he does and I understand the people who say like I really like to drink it but I from my opinion just say like I don't think it's good I think and it's when I when I smell this I only smell glue I think it completely a, I think fucks it's me up I think it's a trauma if I would have tasted this wine like you uh, five years six years ago honestly Pascal I probably would have said the exact same thing as you were saying and now let's note to rest my case, this is far too cold right now. But I probably would have said, no, but I would have probably said the same. But I probably would have said the same about Stromae. And I think for me, the Stromae and this go exactly in the same category. There is some classic defaults. There is some annoyingness. There is some irritation, like what I said no. about the grapefruit. No. Uh, but let's give this some temperature some time to rest and think about it from my perspective if you you found these faults annoying at that time in your life because you probably didn't really uh, have ever tasted shit like this before now we are drinking so much more acidic wines we're smelling so much more nail polish we're getting used to this stuff so much more I agree but it's like when when you are a kid and you threw up on flugel drinks or on Bri Bacardi Breezers, you can never ever stand on Jägermeister. I started Meister. working when I was 14. I, yes. I drank wine when I was But you can was never 14. stand that smell again. And I, no, but honestly, drinking something like this is not for the faint hearted. True. So if you're not completely prepared and this shit is thrown in your face, it's gonna stand against you. I have this with IPA. I was 14 years old, I was going on a fishing trip. Some guy gave me like the most tough fucking hoppy IPA I ever had. And after I had like for 10 years problems with bitters. 
because it was such a fucking horrible idea. I have the same with Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. When I drink Sauvignon Blanc too much, I'm like, man, I'm done with this smell in the drink. But uh, the smell is rough. But uh, with the maceration, I think the flavor is so smooth and gentle. Huh. You know what the, the, the thing is, what it's is my... So oxidized. So the, the thing is, what, what my biggest wish for the wine world is, Oxidative. and this is really something I, I, I hope for and I work my, my hard art for, even though I, I left this business, but actually I don't, because now we, we, we do this shit, this is my glass. Good. What we, what I would love to have so much is Fuck, that the is people... Is it actually called COVID-19 because it's from 2019? Fuck off. Oh, it's, I don't know. I don't know. Google <laughs> <laughs> Is this really true? Right. Yeah, it's probably, yeah. It was SARS in 2012, then we have a problem. Google it. No, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put this in the comment section. <laughs> there's the comment section. They're yes, deactivated. There, there's a comment section. The COVID-19 is a vintage. Boom. The, 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 big, the big approach or the biggest target I have in the wine business is that the people are going completely away from putting stamps on things. I hope that the people who are drinking Bordeaux and Burgundy and Supertussens and Napa Valley 90 shit, meet the guys. Did you ever drink, what is it called? Cask 23 or something? Bin. From, no, 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 that's Penfolds. But did you ever drink that old? This is fucking delicious. And also if you drink old Grange, that's fucking delicious. Do you drink it young and shit? What I want to say is, you really need to take, I, I want that the people who are drinking natural wine and they think like, oh my God, orange wine, oh my God, natural wine, oh my God, sulfites, that they meet the people who are really from the old age yeah. and drink Bordeaux and Burgundy and they just meet each other and say like, good wine is good wine. I but it has to be on point. If you give a Bordeaux drinker the Strohmeyer, they're probably gonna say it's shit because it's way too acidic. Uh, I get that, but I, I just wanna meet them. Because do you know what the best thing is? On the planet with wine, is when you have one big table, there's a shitload of good wine on the table, there's a shitload of good food on the table, and all of a sudden no one is bitching around about wine. I got Same the, with this now. I got one word for you. Hank. Hank is a fucking... I fucking love the name Hank. A 60-something year old. A 60 year old, sorry Hank, if you're watching. Uh, who, came, who came from this. Who is exactly this. And the funny thing is, when you taste his wines, when you drink the wines, that he imports, it is that. It is that 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 mixture of, the guy was drinking natural wine in 1990, man. He was drinking La Pierre then, he drank all this stuff. Like today, I posted a picture for the wine import uh, from Maupertuis. Yeah. And then I looked up the story and he's been importing it since 2005, you know. This guy came from a background of drinking Bordeaux, drinking Burgundy. And uh, for the same, uh, it goes for David Bodeme, Jan Verrukel, they all started with Burgundy as well. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, there is no big divide, but um, it's a different world than like Figo, maybe also a bit me. I think you're a bit more classical in this sense than me. And I don't know if there's like this big... Not, if I, just, I just come from the old, really young. Yeah. And then I, along the way of my career, yeah, all of a sudden, there was one dude, which I still put my, what, what, what the fuck do you call it? As my wine mentor 2.0. And he came to me, was like, try this. And I tried and I was like, I'm gonna work for you. Fuck that, it's fucking awesome. Yeah. And this is when I started to, to fall in love with natural wine. But it also, completely changed my wine thing. But also here, with people that drink wine and with winemakers, there's not such a big difference. It's not a black and white. There is not natural wine and unnatural wine. This is a fucking thing I'm bothered with, you know? There is every grade of doing this. You know, you got people that go fucking hardcore, but also work from a caravan and live in a tent, making shit that mouses up completely on every which way. Mm. You have people, like now, uh, that Bolme told me, like Chateau Palmer, uh, one of the most classic Bordeaux houses there is in, is working in uh, yeah, it's, I think yeah. it's in Spain. Uh, they <laughs> are <laughs> they are uh, they are they are now working practically uh, natural. 
they have re they have reduced sulfur levels to 40 since 2000 and I don't know um, please comment David 16 17 or something they're working with only indigenous yeast he said then when you now drive up to the chateau where there used to be just black soil and some ro rows of uh, vines there is now wild asparagus flowers and everything okay but when was the last time you drank Chateau Palmer? I never drank and drank it. Okay, because this is the thing with... Because it's unaffordable, but I, I'm just saying true. that the, the, the divide between natural or not natural wine, for me, it doesn't exist. But the thing there is... is not, there's like people who think that natural wine is a taste. It's not a taste, it's not a way, it's not a, it's, there's, not a, there's not a boundary. But Arjan, if I drink Chateau Palmer now, like the newest vintage and I buy it, I probably still don't like it but if you age so it for, but if you age it for 20 years you probably will like always with palmier but it has nothing to do with conventional and biological winemaking no. and on the other hand when we drink this it's not it's not the biological you know, let me finish it's not the biological thing because i still wear my clothes from zara and they're probably made from child's yeah. fingers in indonesia so that shit is wrong so if you're a like, biological winemaker who drives a fucking porsche cayenne you you're still Fred Cosa, give it up give it up <laughs> yeah but he should drive a porsche he, i'm embarrassed that he's driving a, a, a porsche cayenne he should drive a fucking maserati he drives, a Cabrio. He drives a 911. he's probably not watching this so we're good with the copyrights I, I, I've, the heard, I don't I, want. I've heard the the rumor that Fred Cosa can and this I still is the gossip section. And I no, but it's the thing: natural wine yeah. drinkers do they drink it because they think it's this biological? This is the part of the episode. Do they drink natural wine because it's biological? No, they drink it because they fucking love it. And that's why I don't understand natural wine drinkers who say like, "I don't like conventional stuff." It's just wrong. Good stuff will be good stuff. Drink the good thing will always be the good thing who decides what is the good thing my point quality but who decides quality what is natural wine and what isn't if you would take all the wine importers in amsterdam which are super knowledgeable people that all import wonderful stuff yeah they all have a different definition of what is natural wine you know i know michiel he has uh, uh, he has a certain rules he, like he says it needs to have a certain form of water in it and if I cannot drink a bottle at home in my own for in an hour and a half, I won't buy it. What, does, it, what, what does he say? He says that if you can't drink a bottle of something in one and a half hour at yeah. home on the couch, you won't buy it. If you ask but Hank, if you drink it on the couch, I already bought it. If you ask Hank, it has You're also a lot to question. do with accessibility. So Hank always says... For me, natural wine also has to do with that. It's accessible for a lot of people. So it should be made by the people, for the people. So it should never be above 15 euros. Above, I find it bullshit. And I really don't agree with that they are making something of which they make it as blasé as pop possible, but then they make it as expensive as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, Figo is all about taste. He's very exact. And uh, Bolomé is very much about emotion, about how wine is made, how people are, uh, for what kind of people he's selling it. He, he's selling high-end Bordeaux, but also beautiful natural wine. So, you know, I think everybody should define what is for them natural wine. Okay, should we wrap this up? Yes, we're wrapping this up. Ah, we what about the Strohmeyer, man? Let's start. Okay, this so Strohmeyer, Frisante, uh, Blaue, Bibacha. 11% coming from Zyverweine, my big boy Figo, super good. I think probably the winner of the of the day. I Shame fucking me. love it. I you actually, you actually, if you would have gotten another bottle now, would you open it? 100%. To finish? This ah. is the biggest compliment, I think, for This is the thing what you love about uh, Frizzante and exactly. that kind of thing. But it's the thing, you know, you get this bottle and you're like, what the fuck is this label and the back thing? No, and it's Blau Wildbacher and it's Frizzante and whatever. And it's actually, it's the winner of the day because for me, it's like super easy going to drink, super nice mineralic. Um, finish. Great fruit in a bottle. Blue Some, Rosenberg, yeah. I something for your body, soul, and mind. Exactly. I still. Do you have an inner glass right no. now? I do. I love the smell, man. It's it if, you, if you drink Muscat and Tramina. Michi. Mango. Parfum. Look, 
I think it's good. I think it's okay. I don't think it blows my mind. Um, okay, I think you should explain the Rifo because I, I can't. Explain, we already did. I think. Uh, oh, what do you like about the Rifo? I don't know what I like about the Rifo. That is what I like. I find also this harsh. Jeez, uh, Arian, sorry. I don't know what I like about Rifo. And that's Fuck what off. and that's what I like. I think it's a wine that I'm still every time I drink it, I have to contemplate it. It it's such not an easy. It's like music. You you you, you kind of really want to hear it. I really kind of want to like it, but put it on in the morning. Yeah, maybe not. You put it in the car when your mom is in the car. No, nah, probably not. But do I always feel the urge to buy it and drink it? Yes. And that's a fucking weird emotion for a wine. And that's that energy, that contradiction. That for me is the essence for me with Rifo. I, I, I don't even know why I like to drink the whole bottle. But for some stupid reason, if I can choose between these two, I pick this because it, it interests me until the end of time and I think that energy and that emotion that for me is the essence of this guy it's cool. pure magic that's, that's right up. let's quit it yeah it's Bazanji 919 check it check it uh I said this industry is doggy dog and y'all sleeping all these Mickey D's rappers around me that I